the International Nurses Society on Addictions webinar series that focuses on the use of opioid therapies for treatment of opioid dependence and on the safe use of opioids in the treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of many resources made available by the Prescriber's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies, a program funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations. The American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. Let me just go over a few quick housekeeping notes before we get to today's presentation. In the upper right side of your computer screen, you'll see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, participants can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. If we're unable to get to all your questions in the allotted time, Dr. Jones has agreed to respond to them in writing. The webinar, presentation slides, and questions and answers will be posted on the website in the near future. Today, Dr. Andre Jones will address treating women for opioid dependence during pregnancy and the postpartum period, the importance of science and clinical care informing each other. She will review the benefits and risks of providing methadone, buprenorphine, or medication-assisted withdrawal during pregnancy for the mother, fetus, and neonate, identify the benefits of measuring and treating neonatal opioid withdrawal using different assessment tools and medication strategies, and examining the different approaches for dealing with the problem behaviors related to opioid addiction during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Andre Jones, Ph.D., is a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology School of Medicine, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is director of Horizons, a comprehensive drug treatment program for pregnant and parenting women and their drug-exposed children. She is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, School of Medicine, Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Jones is an internationally recognized expert in the development and examination of both behavioral and pharmacologic treatments for pregnant women and their children in risky life situations. Dr. Jones has re received continuous funding from the United States Nas National Institutes of Health since 1994 and has published over 130 peer-reviewed publications, two books on treating substance use disorders, one for pregnant and parenting women, and the other for a more general population of patients. She has also published several books and textbook chapters and has a multi multiple editorial letters and non-peer-reviewed articles for clinicians. She is a consultant for the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Dr. Jones leads or is involved in projects in Afghanistan, the Southern, Southern Cone, the Republic of Georgia, South Africa, and the United States, which are focused on improving the lives of children, women, and families. Welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure um, to be able to give this webinar today, and um, I'm looking forward to a good exchange of information. Uh, the objectives of the talk today are to compare and contrast the benefits and risks of providing methadone and buprenorphine or methadone-assisted withdrawal, also known as detoxification, during pregnancy for the mother, the fetus, as well as the neonate. I'll also spend a bit of time examining the benefits of measuring and treating neonatal opioid withdrawal, also known as neonatal abstinence syndrome, using different assessment tools and medication strategies. And then finally, I will touch on some strategies to deal with some challenging patients. As far as disclosures, I am going to be talking about two different medications, methadone and buprenorphine. Both are currently labeled as FDA cate pregnancy category C, which means that um, animal reproduction studies have shown that there are adverse effects on the fetus, but we don't have adequate and well-controlled studies in humans. 
And really, the physician and patient need to use these medications at their own risks. Um, also, as a disclosure, um, both of these medications, I do need to clarify that both of these medications should actually not be considered off-label use. I know that many people think that they are off-label, but I have heard from the FDA that they are not considered off-label use. There are um, There is information in the product inserts uh, for both of these medications about pregnancy. And finally, I need to acknowledge Rick and Bankeiser for donating both active as well as placebo tablets and for reimbursing me for time and travel in 2011. As far as acknowledgments, uh, some of the data that I will share with you today from the mother study, a randomized controlled trial, um, takes an entire village of people um, contributing their time and effort and dedication to bring the data to you today. So I want to acknowledge all of those teams from the many um, different sites that we had, and most importantly, the patients and the infants, for without them, we would not have these data, and also the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, for their generous support of our projects. The outline of the way we're going to spend the next uh, 45 minutes is to look at the historical as well as current context of opioid use during pregnancy. I'll review methadone and buprenorphine very briefly and touch on medication-assisted withdrawal touch on the neonatal abstinence measures and treatments, and then some strategies for addressing challenging patients. So to put this um, problem in context, uh, Stephen Kandel has written a wonderful book called Substance and Shadow in 1996, and I would refer any of our listeners to that excellent book. And one of the things that he had noted in his book was that many women, between 66 to 75 percent of women, um, were actually um, opioid using women. And um, in terms of the sources of drugs that they were using, opium was the, the main source, was the main drug, and it was commonly used to treat pain. And early on, physicians had recognized that the women who were receiving the opium, who then became pregnant and delivered, their babies actually went through an opioid withdrawal. And some of those physicians actually used opium or morphine to treat um, the, the neonatal withdrawal in order to prevent babies from dying and having other complications. In 1914, there was the Harrison Narcotic Act. And it was really after that that um, physicians uh, had a decrease to ended up being an inability to prescribe um, opioids to um, patients just for um, maintaining them due to an addiction. And so opium addiction really got pushed, as did all of um, different types of addiction, from mainstream medical practice. And in terms of the topic that we're going to be talking about today, I think it's really important up front to give a definition of neonatal abstinence syndrome, because that is one of the most um, concerning things to people uh, that um, when they are dealing with women who are pregnant and opioid dependent. And so to define neonatal abstinence syndrome, it is a constellation of signs and symptoms, including neurologic excitability, so the babies are often hyperactive, they have difficulty sleeping, and they can be irritable. They can have gastrointestinal dysfunction, so a discoordinated sucking and swallowing, and um, more frequent vomiting. And they can also have autonomic signs of fever and sweating and nasal stuffiness. Uh, the best that I could find was about in 1965 that good friends and colleagues reported neonatal withdrawal signs. And then in 1971, Zelson and colleagues reported the frequency of signs um, looking at uh, different babies and born to drug abusing mothers. And then in 1975, Desmond and Wilson published a neonatal abstinence syndrome recognition and diagnosis, as well as um, Dr. Finnegan, who has the most widely used and well-known tool, the neonatal abstinence syndrome tool, to measure um, and then uh, provided a medication protocol to treat babies that were um, receiving, that uh, were, uh, sorry, that had uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome. In terms of the uh, sort of the state of where this problem is in, with, the, um, with the pregnant women. We have data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And if you'll focus on the bars just in the non-pregnant segment compared to the bars with the preg oh, oh, sorry, pregnant segment, um, 
sorry about that. Uh, you can see that tobacco and alcohol right here are the two most widely used drugs for both pregnant as well as non-pregnant women. And then if you look at heroin and pain relievers, you can barely even see heroin. Um, and you can see the pain relievers there. Now these data are based on self-report, obviously, so this is a likely underestimate of um, the true extent of the problem. But one of the things that you'll notice comparing the non-pregnant to the pregnant is that fewer women are reporting using any type of substance during, during pregnancy compared to non-pregnancy. We also know that these data tend to go back up postpartum. Um, so that, in some ways, that is good news because that means that some women are becoming pregnant and spontaneously quitting. And for other women, they're going to need more help with, um, with stopping their substance use if they wish to do that. So I think that it's important to look at these small bars because many of us working in hospitals, it seems like you know 40 to 80 percent, I've even heard in some places, we have babies being born um, with a tox-positive urine with, uh, for opioids. And so if we look across the United States, I think it is important to keep this in mind um, that it is you know, somewhat a smaller proportion, but it is very serious nonetheless. And then these are data from uh, Pat Stephen Patrick and his colleagues. And they were um, recently published in JAMA. And these data really got a tremendous amount of national attention. And what you'll see if you focus up here on the, on the top graph is that these are weighted national estimates of the rates of maternal opioid use per 1,000 hospital births. So you can see that the rate is going from, um, in year 2000, from 1.2 to 2009 to 5.6. So the rates of moms coming in um, with opioid use is increasing in our hospitals. And as we would expect, if you have pregnant women that are using opiates, you're going to have babies that are also going to be having neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that um, those figures have also increased from 1.2 in 2000 to 3.4 in 2009. And I think it's very important when we're talking about opioid use disorders during pregnancy that we talk about addiction. And I, for the sake of this talk, I put up a definition by ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, to kind of just ground us in what we're talking about today. And it's defined, they have defined addiction, um, I'll focus here, it's really characterized by the inability to consistently abstain from a substance, and the substance we're talking about today is opioids, um, that there's impair impairment in behavioral control. So that means that women will um, you know, avoid um, obligations. They can't, they can't control the amount that they're going to have. Um, they can't control their stopping until they run out of drugs. They have severe craving for the opioids. Um, they have diminished recognition in terms of the significant problems that it's causing in their own behavior. And for women, particularly in our interpersonal relationships, women are very um, relational in general. And so when, these, when they have um, decrements in their relationships or, and the relationships begin to fall apart, this is often when they start to seek treatment. Um, and then the, another important part of the addiction definition is the dysfunctional emotional response. I think it's also important to remind ourselves that um, opioid addiction is a chronic disease and that it involves cycles of relapse and remission. That doesn't mean that that's for every single person or patient, but certainly it is very common that there are cycles of relapse and remission. And I think that you know, without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, it really can um, be life-threatening. We have overdose deaths. We have women that have died if they're not in treatment. And we need to get more people into treatment. So what does addiction look like in women compared to men? Um, as I said in the previous slide, for women, much of their lives are really focused on relationships. And so for them, what we often hear from the women that come into our programs is that they started using in the context of an intimate partner relationship. So for example, they might have started using with a boyfriend. Um, or in some cases, they were actually given drugs in order for um, uh, friends or close associates to um, abuse them or molest them. She's often uh, men. It's a very much of a man's world in terms of the drug scene. And so she is often reliant completely on men for how she obtains her drugs. So she has to go through men. She has to call around. She has to go to the street corner um, to go through those, those male barriers. And so often she is put in a very compromising situation and has to exchange sex 
for those drugs or other types of behaviors um, that could put her in very com compromising and risky situations to get her drugs. And where she uses drugs, um, it is often a very private and personal uh, um, type of behavior. So you know, she doesn't want her children to see. If she has children, she'll often use in the bathroom. She'll go to any, you know, any place that is going to be hidden away um, because there's a tremendous amount of shame and stigma for women. That's not to say that it's not there for men, um, but oftentimes it's much harder for women to hide their drug use because of the multiple demands for women as being, as being daughters, being wives or intimate partners and being family members and mothers. And then how she recovers from drug use can also look different um, from men in terms of, again, she has um, to get up to care for her children. Uh, so she's uh, oftentimes she's going to see if she can change her pattern of drug use so that she's recovering in a time when it's not going to impact her children. And I think it's vitally important topic for some people and it creates a lot of emotion one way or another. Um, it can create you know, anger, it can create empathy, sympathy, and disgust. Um, but I think we need concerns about using opioid medication during pregnancy. I think we need to look at what happens if we don't use those medications and we certainly know the, um, the life-threatening ramifications that untreated addiction can um, place a woman in as well as her fetus. And there are a number of other issues. A drug use for women does not happen in isolation. Um, it happens in a whole host of very complex psychosocial circumstances. Many of the women that we've treated uh, in, the, in either Horizons or in the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy have um, been victims of childhood trauma, abuse and neglect themselves. And that violence and abuse is continued throughout their lives. They're often not, not the first uh, generation of drug users in their family. They often haven't had formal patient or economic opportunities in order to gain economic independence. Um, they have, some of them will have legal involvement either from their sex trade work or from child protective services or, other, or um, even the drug trade itself. And they are not only opioid users often. We know that, for example, well over 90% of um, women in opioid dependence treatment who are pregnant are, smoking, are smokers. Um, they all, many of them are also using alcohol or using benzodiazepines or cocaine or marijuana. Um, so we need to be thinking of those drugs in combination with either the opioid and with our opioid medications that we'll use to treat the opioid dependence. They often have limited parenting skills, um, multiple psychiatric issues, unstable housing, and food insecurity and lack of nutrition, as well as dehydration. And I think it's really important when we're working with pregnant and postpartum women that we definitely need to be talking about hydration, and not just in the forms of soft drinks. I can't tell you how many times I've been in groups and I see Mountain Dews or Coca-Colas, but in terms of the importance of drinking water, because we know that that's important um, for pregnancy as well as uh, important for milk production. And then when we're looking at children who we know have been prenatally opioid exposed and who might have an opioid or a neonatal abstinence syndrome, I think it's really important um, to not forget that that too doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, that it, when we're looking at the long-term outcomes, you know, just having a neonatal abstinence syndrome isn't um, a, a definite to say that these children will have problems later in life. There's so many other things. Yes, being prenatally exposed to drugs is a risk factor, but it is only one risk factor of many different risk factors, which and these risk factors are here on the slide, that can often trump um, any type of prenatal exposure to different types of substances. So just to summarize that first um, part of the talk, uh, so we know that opioid misuse during pregnancy certainly occurs less frequently than alcohol and tobacco use. However, it is still a serious and growing issue um, that deserves our, that th these women deserve um, a, a, the opportunity for treatment and the opportunity um, for intervention. Um, we know that the increased use of opioids by pregnant women obviously is going to drive an increase in neonatal opioid withdrawal or neonatal abstinence syndrome. And we know that it is a complex uh, disorder that is intertwined uh, with the environment, with family, with social and other types of factors that can either contribute or miss 
consequences. So, you know, this issue cuts across all socioeconomic strata. And so there are women who have many means who have opioid dependence, and there are women that have very few means. And so you know, the social determinants of health, I think, are vitally important longer-term health and outcome of the mother and her family. And finally, women definitely have unique needs for addiction treatment. Um, and so this complex illness definitely deserves a multifaceted intervention to help her overcome and thrive in her life. So now let me turn to the medications that treat opioid dependence. And for any medication, if we're talking about methadone or buprenorphine, um, we want to prevent the mom from using these opioids that are going to you know, expose her and her fetus to you know, increasing um, withdrawal and bolus amounts of drugs, that sort of um, roller coaster effect. We want a drug that is going to um, harmonize the fetal environment and something that she doesn't have to take multiple times a day and will help her obtain drug abstinence and then be able to make other changes in her life and avoid other risk behaviors that might place her at risk for HIV or hepatitis or other infections. And then we certainly know that um, methadone has been used for many years and it is it reduces uh, um, the incidence of obstetrical and fetal compl complications and it improves outcomes. This is methadone, just a, a picture of it. It is obviously a mu opioid agonist, and its half-life is somewhere between 24 to 36 hours. And it is best viewed as one part of a complete treatment approach. It has been used for over 40 years and is a life-saving medication, both for pregnant as well as non-pregnant patients. Um, it can be provided either in an inpatient or an outpatient setting for pregnant women. And typically, patients begin methadone uh, when they haven't been using opioids and when they're in mild withdrawal. Before placing a woman on methadone maintenance, we want to make sure that we've ruled out benzodiazepines or alcohol um, because we want to make sure that she's not overly sedated. Patients are typically given one observed dose, somewhere between 10 and 30 milligrams. And then she should be observed for possible adverse effects. And then if she doesn't have adverse effects, then that dose can be titrated over the next several days um, to a few weeks to avoid um, possible use of illicit opioids. And, but we need to be looking at her and talking with her and asking her about her withdrawal and how the medication is holding her. And we know that for as many patients, there are as many doses. Um, and we can't just have artificial ceilings or artificial uh, floors for medication doses. It really, truly needs to be individually tailored. And we know that there are a number of medications that can interact with methadone that can create um, either more methadone being in her body or um, faster metabolizing of that methadone. So we need to be very cognizant of a number of issues. And I guess the bottom line was, would be that the methadone dosing for pregnant women really doesn't have to be more complicated. Um, I will touch on uh, medication-assisted withdrawal here. I only have one slide about that. Um, and that's really because I think what the literature would suggest is that it is not optimal to taper pregnant women, certainly if they're methadone maintained, um, unless there is some major issue that would um, not allow her to receive methadone. Um, she really should remain on her stable dose of methadone. Um, for those women that are you know, using heroin or using other opioids on the street and come in, what we know, and we, we can see here, just in terms of days retained in treatment, these are women that received only three days of methadone taper or um, seven days of methadone taper. And you can see that the methadone, the women that got seven days stayed um, almost twice as long as those that had gotten the three days. And if at any point they were switched over to methadone ma maintenance, they stayed for a similar amount of time um, as those women that started out on methadone maintenance. So what this little graph shows is that methadone retains women in treatment. And when we, when we retain women in treatment, that allows them the opportunity to access all of the other types of services that are available in comprehensive care, or even obstetrical care, or um, you know, less fancier versions of, uh, of treatment. Um, and then in the bottom graph, you can see here just the urine um, results at delivery. So for the three-day and the seven-day, those women that were not maintained on methadone, you can see that they have somewhat higher um, positive rates of, of um, uh, tox toxins at delivery compared to those that were receiving methadone at any point in their pregnancy. 
And so I recognize um, that one of the big concerns is neonatal abstinence syndrome, and so that can be a motivating factor for providers as well as patients to not receive um, agonist treatment, including methadone maintenance. But I think we really need to look at the fact that neonatal abstinence syndrome, it is um, diagnosable, it is treatable, and we don't have data to suggest that there are long-term negative consequences of either being treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome or having a neonatal abstinence syndrome. Certainly, neonatal abstinence syndrome does put a child um, at risk for um, potentially more complicated uh, attachment behavior with the mom, but there are certainly interventions that can address that too. Uh, there has been um, somewhat of a controversy in the earlier literature looking at the dose relationship, and there was concern that if um, a greater methadone dose was given to a mom that the baby might have a greater neonatal abstinence syndrome severity. And there was a very nice review that was done by Brian Cleary, published in Addiction in 2010. And the bottom line to that was that the severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome doesn't appear to differ according to whether mothers are on high or low dose methadone maintenance therapy. So what we tell our women is that we need to treat you first and foremost, and if we're treating you and you are adequately um, maintained on your medication, then um, we will be prepared and we can treat the baby as needed. We also know from methadone that split dosing um, can help to even more um, normalize the fetal um, the fetal environment. And so where it's possible, I think um, I would encourage people to be able to split the dose. I know that that creates uh, a tremendous more burden on the clinical staff and um, also on the patient, and so that's not always the case. But there are certainly data to suggest that this does help um, with reducing the um, depression in fetal um, heart rate and movement. In terms of methadone and neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, with the approximately between 55 to 90 percent of babies that are exposed to methadone prenatally will have signs of neonatal abstinence syndrome. A little um, or around 60 percent will require treatment for it. And the most common medication that's used to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome is morphine. And the most common scale is the Finnegan scale, although it seems like every hospital I talk to has modified Finnegan scale in some way, or, um, form or another. Um, and unfortunately, right now, we don't have any standard um, uniform protocols for treatment. Hopefully, with the studies that are ongoing out there, we will have some answers to that, and we will be able to know which medication is best um, to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome. I think it's also important to look, and this kind of goes back to Brian Cleary's uh, review that he did, because there is variability in the literature in terms of that relationship between maternal methadone dose and neonatal abstinence severity. So there must be some other factors that might be at play with the severity of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. And I think one of the big ones that often gets overlooked is what type of neonatal abstinence syndrome assessment tool you are using, what medication uh, you are using, and how uh, quickly you are maintaining the baby and how qu quickly you are weaning the baby. Because I've seen um, protocols where babies stay in the hospital for a month. I've seen protocols where babies stay in the hospital for 10 days. So this makes what you're doing and how you're assessing and treating makes a huge difference on that length of hospital stay. And certainly, there's very nice literature looking at the contribution of benzodiazepines and cigarette smoking, as well as antidepressants on exacerbating the severity of any natal abstinence syndrome. Turning now to pain management with methadone, um, I think that there are a lot of misconceptions. People can often be very concerned about if I give methadone, if I give um, an opioid agonist to a methadone-maintained woman, will she misuse it? Will um, it cause respiratory depression and overdose? You know, she's just trying. She, it's just her addictive behavior coming out. She really doesn't need anything. And we know that those things um, can be concerns. It certainly depends on the patient. But by and large, what we have learned is that uh, patients that are maintained on an opioid agonist like methadone actually experience more pain. They're hyper or they're hyperalges analgesic. And so um, we need to be able to aggressively treat their pain like we would treat non-opioid dependent um, people too. And there has been some literature looking at using um, PCA pumps as well as NSAIDs and acetaminophen in addition to the methadone. So we didn't discontinue methadone dosage. We kept their methadone dosage where it was and added um, more opioid agonists as well as um, the other non-opioids and were able to successfully control uh, postpartum pain. I think it's also 
vitally important, and that's why I put it in italics here, that we need to avoid um, a, a partial agonist antagonist, like uh, what we say, no new bane. Um, I know that those, those types of medications are often used in obstetrical practices, but that those medications can throw an opioid maintained woman into withdrawal, and we want to avoid that. So general recommendations, we don't want to stop the methadone agonist treatment. Um, we want to take her pain seriously and treat it. Uh, and that you can um, give uh, higher doses of opioid analgesic in shorter intervals with these types of patients. And we also want to make sure that we know um, some women that have PTSD can also have elevated um, sensitivity towards pain. And that the whole act of um, giving birth can really create some trauma uh, some re-traumatizing of the women again, and so we want to be very sensitive to that too. In terms of breastfeeding, it, it, methadone is compatible with breast milk, um, and uh, we know that the actual dose of methadone that gets ingested is very small. Um, there have been several studies looking at the relationship between breastfeeding actually reducing the severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and so I think that it might not be the methadone itself, but actually the whole act of breastfeeding that goes along with being able in the skin-to-skin -skin contact to producing that neonatal abstinence severity. Um, and not to forget that there are certainly many barriers to breastfeeding. Um, sometimes I hear that providers aren't allowing women who are stabilized on methadone maintenance to be able to breastfeed, and I think as long as these women are not using other drugs and they're HIV negative, in the United States that we can um, allow methadone to be compatible with breastfeeding and support her. Um, sometimes women feel that, that um, their breasts are in, um, sexual objects and don't want the child to be on their breasts. There are many different types of issues that might come up around breastfeeding, but if you have a really good lactation consultant, she can help or he can help um, overcome those barriers. In terms of long-term developmental effects with um, the children, the literature really has not been consistent with, the, uh, with um, prenatal exposure to methadone causing any type of long-term damaging effects to children. And I think the most important thing that the literature has found is that, yes, okay, prenatal drug exposure can be one risk factor, but it is only one of many. And what often trumps that is the environment in which the children is the children are growing up in, in terms of their nutritional status, their family unity, their attachment history, um, and a lot of times when you look at that the literature on this area, there are um, not compatible comparison groups to fairly compare these children to other children. So just to summarize the methadone part, we have well over 40 years of documented benefits of methadone. The induction is relatively simple. Um, we can achieve adequate doses, and we need to give women adequate doses so that they don't have withdrawal. Uh, certainly, we can minimize the uh, fetal suppression if we are splitting doses. And we know that neonatal abstinence syndrome can be um, more severe if we have heavier smoking women, and that breastfeeding is compatible with methadone. Let me move on to buprenorphine. Buprenorphine has a somewhat different pharmacology. It is a mixed agonist. Um, and it has a sealing effect. So basically what it does is it lobs on to the receptor, and it sticks there, and it doesn't fully activate the receptor. And so what that means in clinical terms is that um, you're going to have less chance of respiratory uh, suppression, and um, it's a less chance of potentially of, of, odor, of uh, overdose. And it has a half-life of 24 to 60 hours. There are a couple of different forms of it. Um, the newest form is a sublingual film that has been used. And the, the type of buprenorphine that we use in our pregnancy studies is Subutex, the mono product. So that's buprenorphine alone and not buprenorphine with a naloxone, which was put in there uh, in an effort to prevent people from diverting it. If they injected it, they would get a nasty withdrawal. Buprenorphine is a little trickier um, to be able to induct patients on to. Uh, they need to be, patients need to be in withdrawal. Uh, if you give buprenorphine to somebody that is um, actively on opiates, you can, you can possibly precipitate a withdrawal. Um, so the induction needs to um, typically takes place over a three-day period, and typically starting with somewhere between 12, uh, 8 to 12 milligrams and going up the, the ceiling dose is um, 32 milligrams, but not pa the patients, you know, again, like methadone, it, the dosing needs to be individualized, so not all patients need to go up to such a high dose. 
Uh, Dr. Meyer, March Myers at the University of Vermont has developed an outpatient protocol for induction, and she's using the CENA, um, which is a more objective opioid uh, withdrawal measurement tool, and waiting till she, the patients are in um, somewhat mild withdrawal, and then initiating the treatment and adjusting the dose according to um, signs and symptoms as, as well as opioid urine uh, positive tests. Uh, we have a fair bit of literature looking at prenatal opioid expo exposure uh, with buprenorphine, and we have at least 750 unique babies in the literature, and the dose range is all over the place from 0.4 to 32 milligrams. Um, and it's the data with it is that um, the, both the fetus and the mother seem to tolerate uh, the medication. It's generally safe. Um, most of the buprenorphine literature has been in comparison to methadone um, because we don't, it's not ethical anymore to compare um, a medication to nothing because we know the life-saving benefits of these medications. And most of our research would suggest that the maternal outcomes are very similar to those of methadone. In terms of fetal outcomes, these are secondary data from our mother study. I'll show you the primary data in a little bit. Uh, but what we found was that this is um, methadone and these are non-reactive stress tests. And so buprenorphine seems to have somewhat of a, um, a less suppressive effect than, than methadone. That's not a terribly surprising finding given the pharmacology of the medications, but it is something that is there. Um, in terms of neonatal abstinence syndrome with buprenorphine, um, the incidence is about the same as it is with methadone, um, about 50%. It takes about 48 hours for the onset of neonatal abstinence syndrome, and it can peak somewhere between um, three and four days. And there have been a couple of uh, reports about a longer onset, and I really think that if we look there carefully at that, there might be some other concomitant drug exposure like benzodiazepines rather than just a direct effect of the buprenorphine withdrawal. And similar to the methadone data, what we know is that the correlation between buprenorphine dose and NAS severity has also been inconsistent. In terms of pain management with a buprenorphine, again, these women also deserve aggressive pain management and ethical pain management. Um, you don't have to stop their dose. That we can um, provide opioids on top of the buprenorphine, and they can respond well to it as well as um, the NSAIDs. In terms of breast milk with buprenorphine, again, the amount, just like methadone, the amount of buprenorphine or buprenorphine metabolite that is in the breast milk is very minimal. And if you think about how buprenorphine is not very orally bioavailable, it, that the amount of exposure that the baby is actually going to get through his drinking the milk is going to be very small. And so recent guidelines suggest that the amounts of buprenorphine in human milk are small and unlikely to have negative effects and that the advantages of breastfeeding are going to prevail in, despite the risks of an opioid intoxication potentially caused by methadone or buprenorphine. So again, it's compatible. In terms of child development, we really don't have a lot of studies looking at long-term outcomes, so the, um, we still await the data for that, but the little bit that we do have doesn't seem like it's different from methadone. Uh, this, these are the sites that participated in our mother's site, in our mother's study. So we had um, Thomas Jefferson, University of Vermont, University of Vienna, University of Toronto, Vanderbilt University, Wayne State, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Maryland. And this was a randomized double-blind trial. And what we found for our um, primary outcome measures, two of them were different. And so we didn't have differences in the proportions of babies that were treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome. Methadone is in green, buprenorphine is in blue. What we did find were significant differences in the amount of morphine that was needed to treat a um, baby who was prenatally exposed to buprenorphine. And they got out of the hospital um, significantly shorter uh, with, uh, with buprenorphine. But both of these medications in the context of um, comprehensive care produced very similar maternal treatment outcomes as well as delivery outcomes. In terms of our secondary outcomes, um, if you look at this, this is what we call our dropout rate. It is not statistically significantly different. It is clinically meaningful. And we've talked a lot about amongst ourselves and in the literature about what this might mean. And I really think that this has a lot to do with the way we did our induction procedure. And if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to answer questions about that. Um, but as you can see here, there weren't any other um, statistically significant differences for number of prenatal visits or normal presentation. They're very similar outcomes for the two groups. 
So I think the beauty of the mother study is that it actually provided the first randomized control data to support the safety and efficacy of methadone. I think that's a fact that has somewhat gotten overlooked, so I want to make sure I highlight that. We have similar outcomes with the mom outcomes. Um, just like uh, methadone and buprenorphine, pain can be managed. It should be managed adequately and aggressively, and breastfeeding should be compatible. Um, and in terms of NAS severity, because we did have uh, significant findings in our primary outcomes, buprenorphine should be a frontline medication for women who are either new to treatment or already maintained on buprenorphine. It, it should not be a frontline treatment for women who are already maintained on methadone. Methadone women who are doing well should not be switched. Um, so NAS and its treatment um, and other factors that might exacerbate or minimize it certainly remains of clinical concern, and we're going to talk very, um, just a little bit about that. Okay, so I think it's important to remember that neonatal abstinence syndrome is really a, a rule out. Um, we need to look at all the other things, and then if nothing else is left, then it could be neonatal abstinence syndrome. I think every nursery needs to have a scoring method and to be able to, measure, to in order to be able to measure the severity of withdrawal. And in terms of pharmacological management, um, you really need to be picking a drug from the same class that is causing the withdrawal. So, for example, morphine for um, if you're treating opioid withdrawal. Uh, it's certainly the decision to use uh, medication therapy on these babies is individualized and it needs to be based on the severity of the signs of withdrawal as well as the assessment of the risks and the benefits. Um, let me just move on to the measurement. So there are a number of different tools. As I said before, the Finnegan scale is the one that's most widely used. Um, Karen Diabolito and Loretta Finnegan actually have, and I give a website at the end, Neo Advances a, a scoring system um, that can walk you through how to do this. There are also other ones, including um, the Neonatal Drug Withdrawal Scoring System and the Lipsis tool, um, which is known as the Lipsis tool. And that uh, has been used in other um, places, including France. And then there's the Austria system. So there are different ones out there, but the Finnegan is the most commonly used. If you look across all of those instruments, they have a couple of commonalities. Um, for example, all of them sum up uh, the item scores. They, they might weigh them or at least give them um, a score. And then the higher the score, the more severe the neonatal abstinence syndrome is uh, deemed to be. Uh, it should be neonatal abstinence syndrome evaluation it should be done every three to four hours during the hospitalization. And we really need to be observing these babies for several days after birth um, and really for the entire hospitalization. And there are differences in how long different hospitals keep um, babies. So I've seen everything from uh, two days to well over 10 days. So it really depends on the hospital system that you're in as to what is considered usual care. Um, and then another commonality is that there's some kind of score that's going to trigger the medication initiation so we can reduce the severity of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. And then there'll be a stabilization on medication, and the um, medication can start to be removed once you're seeing regular behavioral patterns, including eating and sleeping, and very importantly, weight gain. Uh, this is just an example of the tool that we used in the mother study. I'd be happy to provide a copy for those people that are interested in the tool. Um, we had uh, definitions that were developed based on um, modifications of Diabolito's definitions of the different um, items for, that include anywhere from excessive cry down to um, feeding concerns. We actually added the failure to thrive and the irritability for our modification of the Finnegan tool. This is an example of our treatment protocol. So I know it looks quite complicated, but the importance was that um, we, our dose of morphine that we started with was based upon the severity of the score. So a baby that gets a 9 to 12 would start with 0.04 milligrams versus a baby that would start with 9 to 24 would immediately start with 0.16. We had the ability to escalate it. Um, if the baby wasn't responding, we'd escalate the dose. And then we had the ability to wean um, by 0.2. Uh, 0.02 milligrams, I'm sorry. And we did that every 24 hours until the baby was off, unless, of course, we had to escalate again. So I'm happy to send that to you or refer you to Dr. Jansen, who developed that um, treatment protocol. 
In terms of the medications that have been used, uh, there are a whole variety of medications that have been used to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome. And here's just a summary of the different ones. There are also non-pharmacological treatments. And I think that we really need to pay more attention to this, too. I think oftentimes babies get um, treated in very busy nurseries. And it, to the extent that we have the opportunity to give them that skin-to-skin -skin contact, to room in with the mothers when it's appropriate, it can be incredibly beneficial for re helping to reduce the severity of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. So just in terms of NAS recommendations, uh, NAS definitely occurs in the majority of opioid-exposed neonates, that, um, but not in all of them. Medication is used in about half of the cases. Uh, we know that um, we're going to have our, our best ability to reduce the um, morbidity associated with neonatal abstinence syndrome if we are using a standard tool and we are assessing the baby and we were treating with an opioid medication. Let me finally, with the time that I have left, I want to just talk about some strategies to deal with challenging patients. And I don't know how many of you have um, had patients that you feel like this. It says, the doctor doesn't need to examine your hand. The pain is most likely from hitting the call button over 50 times in the last hour. So I know that sometimes we have patients that can be incredibly demanding. And I think opioid-dependent patients can sometimes fall into this category. But I would ask you to not take their behavior personally. I think that that's really important um, to remember the path that they might have walked to get to your hospital in terms of the trauma and the violence and the victimization, the shame um, that they might have experienced. And many times, they create a hard shell in order to reject you before you have an opportunity to reject them. So I think when you see them that having good behavior or doing something, they're very scared about being good mothers often. And so when you see them doing something well, please take the opportunity to praise what they're doing right rather than telling them all the time what they're doing wrong. If you have the opportunity to validate and support them and to affirm them and offer hope and to treat them with respect. Um, these are amazing women who might have done some very challenging things in their lives, um, but they are human. And I often think about the babies. And you know, we all started out as babies, and those women started out as babies. And we want to stop uh, this type of cycle from happening in the future. So if we have the opportunity to intervene with the mom and win her over and get her on our side, we're going to have a much better opportunity to be able to um, help intervene and treat that baby. Um, and oftentimes, we have patients that are really difficult. That say, you know, she can't do anything. She refuses to do anything. And so to the extent that you can help reflect and reframe her perspective and ask her, well, you know, if she can't do that, well, what would you be willing to do in this situation? And then finally, to prepare the environment. And what I mean by that is I know that sometimes women that come um, into the hospital that might come from extremely disadvantaged social environments they might take the toilet paper off all of the toilet paper. They might steal all of the towels. They might steal all of the baby blankets, every single, everything that can be um, leaving that room. And so to the extent that you can prepare that environment um, in order to minimize the opportunity for women being in those challenging situations, it, it will um, help make the hospital um, environment much better for everybody. And then finally, I'm going to um, end my main talk with this slide is that um, people that work with opioid-dependent patients and with their babies have an incredibly stressful job. And I think we need to remember to nurture ourselves um, and to create opportunities to debrief and to use professional counseling, counseling when you know you're really getting burned out and to make sure that you are setting healthy boundaries with this population because they can tend to be very needy. Um, it, if you're not careful, it, you, you can really um, become overwhelmed and overburdened. Um, and I think, finally, to acknowledge your own attitudes, values, and preferences. I'm sure I've said things in the past 45 minutes uh, that might have triggered some really emotional reactions. And so use, this, use you know, those um, opportunities to evaluate yourself and see you know, what you need to reflect upon in order to best um, uh, create a therapeutic and um, nurturing environments for the women and the babies that we deal with. So my take-home messages is that um, I hope you recognize that opioid addiction is a treatable illness, and that um, I, the more medications we have, I often think about medications to treat hypertension or to treat depression, and I wish that we had as many medications to treat opioid dependence and really any addiction um, 
and during pregnancy that we have to treat hypertension and, and depression, and maybe one day we will. Um, and I hope that um, you'll also remember that the resilience or vulnerability of the children that have been prenatally exposed to opioids and or other drugs um, is really very much a function of the postnatal environment, much more so than it is the prenatal environment. And that neonatal abstinence syndrome is a treatable condition, and it really deserves more study to find out what are the most optimal medications and treatment protocols for the babies that we serve. And finally, 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 don't forget to nurture yourself, because that is the key to being able to care for others. And there are some resources, uh, that just different websites that I found. Um, there's a little YouTube video about neonatal abstinence syndrome and how to treat it. Here's um, the Neo Advances with uh, Karen Diapolito and Loretta Finnegan. The Vaughn, the Oxford, the Vermont um, Oxford Network, it seems like it's a um, growing resource uh, for people if they're enrolled in it. And then there's some different types of guidelines that I thought might be of interest to the listeners today. And with that, I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you, Dr. Jones, for an excellent and informative presentation. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, of time for questions. And again, I want to remind you that participants can submit written questions by typing them into the webinar's uh, question box. And Dr. Jones is kindly um, volunteered to answer those afterwards if the webinar needs to end. <clears throat> um, Dr. Jones, I do have one question that came in, and I believe that this was um, came in early in your presentation, I think answered. And if it wasn't, then I'll just ask the attendee to clarify or ask a follow-up question about the safety of breastfeeding in infant, infants whose mothers are taking buprenorphine. And I think that that was covered in your presentation. So uh, if that wasn't uh, covered adequately or if you have a follow-up question, we'll ask you to just enter that one in. Um, a comment that came in was um, a, an, a message of appreciation about the information regarding the use of methadone for chronic pain management. Uh, this uh, clinician spends a great deal of time with patients convincing them of its use as a good pain management alternative. Unless I missed it, there is a concern of prolonged QTs that um, require ongoing monitoring with EKGs for patients on methadone and potential addictive effect if other medications that could also prolong the QT uh, should be considered. Can you comment on that? Sure. No, I mean, I, certainly there is literature to support the long QT um, interval with methadone, um, but I think that if you look across the literature, we've treated thousands and thousands of patients uh, with um, methadone during pregnancy. So yes, it is a it is a risk factor. It's something to consider. But um, if you, you know, provided that the patients don't have that, um, I think that they certainly deserve the benefit of being able to receive the methadone maintenance. Okay. Um, here's a, a question about what, in your opinion, are some of the reasons that some drug and alcohol treatment facilities are reluctant to admit pregnant women? Um, I think the reason that a lot of facilities are, are reluctant for, um, to admit them has to do with fear that they are complex cases and if there would be legal action against them if there was um, the loss of that pregnancy in some way, shape, or form. Um, I, I wish that the, and, and also to maybe feeling that they don't have the adequate resources to be able to serve that patient population. Um, since naloxone is pregnancy category B and buprenorphine is pregnancy category C, why isn't suboxone, buprenorphine plus naloxone used in pregnancy? Um, I think the main reason is because we haven't had a lot of data looking at suboxone. When we first started doing the studies, uh, suboxone was not, was not available, um, but we now do have suboxone and there are a small number of papers, I think every day it feels like it's growing, the, um, with uh, prenatal exposure to suboxone in the literature. And what we're seeing is that those outcomes don't look um, sustain, uh, any real, I don't see any real difference between prenatal exposure to suboxone versus prenatal exposure to buprenorphine. Um, and I can tell you that I know that that is definitely 
um, increasing in popularity with physicians around the United States, for sure. Um, what's the best reference for guidelines in buprenorphine induction in pregnancy? Mm. I would look at um, the Vermont guidelines that, uh, that have specific um, guidelines for pregnancy. And one of the, I, I think the, the website is actually in one of my last, was the second to the last slide. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another question about um, Suboxone. Do you know if anyone's using um, uh, Suboxone for alcohol addiction? Maybe a little off um, outside of what your topic was, but um, we'll ask you as a potential expert. Yeah. Um, I am not aware of people using Suboxone to treat alcohol use disorders in pregnant women. Um, I, I have heard uh, anecdotes uh, that it has been used with non-pregnant patients, but I can't speak to the pregnant patients, nor can I speak to any data to know if, if it's um, in terms of its efficacy or effectiveness. Efficacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have any comparisons been attempted between outcomes in uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome in neonates who were exposed to opioids or opiates? in utero, but did not develop neonatal abstinence syndrome for whatever reason. Uh, can you repeat sure. that? Sure. So okay. uh, are any comparisons between um, outcomes in neonates who had abstinence syndrome and e neonates who were exposed but didn't develop abstinence? I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I understand that. Um, that's a really good question. Not as a specific subset. No, I can't. I can't identify a study right now um, that would have done that. Um, but let uh -huh. me let me go back through the literature just to make sure that I'm not missing anything, and I'm happy to respond to that one in writing um, to give okay. a more complete response to that. Great. Thank you. Um, how might the induction method have affected the dropout rate for buprenorphine in the mother study? Sure. Yeah, so what we did with our induction is that because it was a research study, um, so please keep that in mind, and what we did in order to have our best estimate of the level of dependency, uh, the level of opioid dependency, and then ideally the best um, amount of either methadone or buprenorphine given double blind uh, to start with, we had a washout period. So we maintained women on short acting morphine um, for somewhere between three to five days in order to establish their um, level of opioid dependence. And then we inducted them on to either methadone or buprenorphine under double blind randomized conditions. And I think the mistake that we made is that we anchored our first dose of double-blind study medication on time, and we did not anchor it on either a CALS or a SENA score. And if you notice in Dr. Meyer's protocol that I went through, I know rather quickly, um, she used a SENA score of somewhere between 10 and 12. I think if we had done that and not just said we're going to wait um, you know, 12 hours, I think we would have seen a much different um, uh, uh, discontinuation rate with our buprenorphine group. And actually, talking with Marge and talking with other physicians, actually even at Horizons, John Thorpe is um, routinely prescribing Suboxone to pregnant women. We are not seeing that same sort of differential attrition that we saw in the mother study. So if anything, blame it on the, blame it on the investigators, and please don't blame it on the medication. If it's our first call. Okay. Um, we have uh, just uh, maybe a minute or less left, um, so I'm going to just wrap up for today and to um, thank people for participating in the webinar and Dr. Jones specifically to thank you for your presentation today. Shortly, uh, webinar participants will receive an email from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that includes a link to an evaluation survey. We would ask you to take a few minutes to access it and provide your feedback for today's session.
Today's webinar was recorded and will be posted on the website of the Physicians Clinical Support System Opioid Ther Therapies in the near future, and that website is www.pcss-o.org. A calendar of upcoming events and helpful clinical resources are also available there. All of this information can also be found on the International Nurses Society on Addictions website at www.intnsa.org. We hope that you will join us for upcoming PCSSO sessions, and thank you again for your attendance today. <laughs>